So this is going to be the story about my death, more or less. Um, I've decided to keep a video journal of everything, really, and um, this one is going to be talking about um, all of my suicides. Um, you know what got me here. So as I mentioned before in a letter, <sighs> I should just read the letter, but, um, First memories, um, horrible. My first memories are in grade one and being taken out of grade one to move with this guy that my mom just met. It's my first memory. And I remember screaming no, like not wanting that. And then I remember moving to this place in West Lauren. <sighs> I went back there once for my book. <sighs> Anyways, there was like only one bed, one bedroom. And there was actually a hole in the second bedroom in the floor. Uh, like the entire floor had a hole in it and um, it was like a small room and you could see through to the first floor um, and there was a tenant that actually lived in the first floor and I was never allowed in this room but I always played in there I remember <laughs> obviously my cousin and I would actually run around the hall <laughs> um, this guy turned out to be pretty bad, obviously. Uh, you know, if I ran up the stairs too loud, he'd beat me till I peed my pants. If I missed the bus, um, he would drive me to school, but he would take like some random road. And he would get me out of his van and make me get naked and he would beat me with his belt um, or whatever he felt like from the back of his truck until I peed. Um, it got to a point where if I missed the bus, I would like hold my pee so that I could uh, pee sooner because that was really the only thing that made him stop. Um, one Halloween, my mom made me this costume and he actually made me, um, he didn't, he didn't let me take off the costume um, and then drop me off um, at school with my, with the piss in my pants. Um, in the same time, so I um, would beg my mom. I was scared of him because he would say a lot of things to me if I told my mom and um, so I would always beg her to come with me and she was never capable. I learned later in my life, um, that she was really drugged up at the time. Um, and that he took parts out of her car and, um, isolated her from the rest of our family. And, um, we were trapped there for about, you know, uh, just under a year. <laughs> and, um, the entire time I was scared. Um, 
there were times that um, I was left alone. Um, I remember this time that um, I got home from school and the hydro was cut off and everyone was gone. And my mom and him didn't come home for the whole weekend. And there was no hydro and it was cold. And um, I had to sit in my sleeping bed, my snowsuit, the whole weekend. And um, another time I was left alone, um, you know, I had to cook some food for myself. And I have been like, you know, this is grade one and two and I'm taking care of myself completely. I made my own lunches. Um, but it was just like chocolate milk and sometimes I didn't wash the container out well and it would taste like rotten milk from whenever before or it would taste like this dish soap because I didn't rinse it out properly. Um, there was a lot of learning and I microwaved a fork by myself at home once and then I grabbed it and got severe burns all over and shit myself. And when they came home, they, you know, my, he screamed at me and beat me more. Um, and you know, this isn't even the worst of it. Um, and these are all of my, um, these are one of my mem, my mem. These are where my memories start. And, uh... So my mom was, uh... Really having a hard time as well. And, um... He forced her to have sex with him a lot. And I didn't know this really until later. Um, I just remember being in the bed. Because we all had one bed. And I remember um, on many, many occasions of him uh, having sex with my mom beside me in the bed. And, um, there was this one time that I, um, I, uh, I, I was having an asthma attack and, um, I needed my mom. And, um, and he didn't stop. And he raped her from what I know now. I know now about what happened. And it happened a lot for some reason. My mom couldn't get out of the situation. The police didn't protect us. Um, <laughs> I've talked about this so much, I should be get, getting better at this by now. You know, I always blamed my mom for that. Um, I was really angry at her for everything. <laughs> I 
and we ended up homeless after um, trying to get away from him. And he made it really difficult for my mom to get away from him. And my family didn't help, but made it worse in many ways. <laughs> sort of made, made it seem like it was my mom's fault. And, you know, maybe it was. Um, I don't know. I was like only five or six years old. So, um, I, I have my memories and they're awful. They're really awful. And a lot of stuff happened. A lot more than that. Um, After him, um, you know, my mom broke. She was something different. Uh, she was drinking all day, you know, um, and she had Valium from whatever doctor that she was seeing and uh it was the horrible combination because she just blacked out and uh, she became this different person and i um i had a lot of anger at her for what happened to me and west lauren and you know i'm like seven seven eight two years of um, dealing with this person who wasn't my mother, who was this coping mechanism of what, I don't even know. She, she wasn't, she wasn't there. And um, when she blacked out, we would have these fights and you know, she would just say all of these really, really horrible things to me. Like, you know, I wish that I had an abortion. You know, I should never have had you. Um, just tons of stuff. Um, and um, I remember in grade three, um, you know, it's like a year of her and I homeless here and there, all over the place and her blaming me and um, that I put a bag over my head in the bathroom. I locked the door, she was passed out and I sat there and I put a bag over my head because I knew that people used to say that, you know, you know, be careful, don't, don't put a bag over your head. It could be fatal. And it's all I knew. So I tried it and it hurt, obviously. And um, I tried a few times and then I realized that trying to die, oops, trying to die hurt too much. My mother was so drunk and incapacitated that she didn't even find out or realize that I had tried. I didn't even really know what I was doing at the time or what it meant. I just knew that I didn't want to be alive at eight years old. And 
um, you know, it didn't get better. <laughs> the next time I really tried, because <laughs> I, I, let, I, let, I let, let it go for a long time. Probably until I got to like grade seven or eight. Grade eight, I, grade six, seven, eight, I experienced a lot of bullying. And, um, I told my mom that I wanted to kill myself a lot, actually, and she just kind of ignored me. She was still, she was with this new guy and things went kind of okay for a little bit. I was with my grandmother in her adoption in grade four and, and then um, a little bit of grade five and then things got better. And then my mom's sister died and then, and then she went to this guy in rehab and then things were kind of okay. We were traveling a bit. My cousin was living with us. And then um, I started going to the school and everything changed that after I started going to the school, St. Martin's, where everybody started to bully me and call me a faggot. And I didn't even know what a faggot was at the time. And I was beat up a lot and um, treated like a real fucking piece of shit like a lot of gay people are who have feminine attributes and uh, I didn't really deal with it well you know grade six seven and eight I remember feeling suicidal but I didn't know how to do it you know like I didn't have access to the internet and I didn't have a gun or anything and the bag hurt too much. And so I, I, I didn't really know what to do. And I remember my, there was my, like after grade seven, my God, my mom's boyfriend cheated on her and then things just went right down to like, not as bad as Mike, obviously. It's never really been that bad, but they were constantly fighting and throwing shit at each other. And, you know, I'd wake up in the, it'd be like 4 a.m. And I remember I had this French door to my bedroom in this old house we were living in. I had this tiny little closet of a bedroom with a French door. And I remember um, waking up at 4 a.m. to a chair going through the French door and waking up covered in glass and, uh, they didn't even stop. And, like, my mom pushed him down the stairs and, and then he threw a mirror at her and, you know, they just kept going as I'm picking the glass up off of my bed. And that was happening... You know, my, they fought every night almost, throwing shit at each other. We, you know, we did some vacations and they'd just end up fighting with each other. You know, one would come back with a split lip or something. And and if my mom, if uh, he wasn't there, you know, if he was at work or whatever, and my mom needed someone to bully, um, she put all that energy on me. And because of the sleeping pills or whatever, the Prozac or whatever antidepressant she was on, um, and the alcohol, she would black out all of it. And, you know, I could have scratch marks all over me or bruises and I would approach her the next day and I would talk to her about it and she would look at me like I was making it up like I was lying that it didn't happen because she couldn't remember it and she denied a lot of my experience my whole life and uh, 
And then, yeah, I remember um, the next time I tried to kill myself, like I really tried, uh, was in grade eight. We were in Ottawa, actually, on a school trip after my graduation. I had been kicked out of my house for defending myself against the abuse in like my boxers and bare feet. And I called my uncle and I was staying with my uncle and I was in Toronto, uh, sorry, Ottawa, uh, with the whole class, the whole grade eight class, you know, just about to graduate or whatever. And they started bullying me and I snapped and we were like on the whatever floor, I can't remember when, what floor we were on, but um, I tried to jump off the hotel balcony and um, the students like held me back and um, everybody in the school came to help and changed their opinion of me. Um, and then they were like, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I had, I brought weed with me because my mom obviously had marijuana all the time. Thank God that after 12, that helped a lot too, actually, is having access to marijuana. I don't know if I would have made it anywhere. Speaking of... <sighs> <coughs> much less go <coughs> much better weed back then <coughs> sorry whatever I'm not even gonna edit that out it doesn't matter this is the Canadian weed that we smoke now it's just full of fucking coffee shit <coughs> fucking gives me hives And, um, <coughs> I remember the whole class, like, turned their whole opinion around on me because I finally fought back for the first time. And, uh, I just remember, um, the whole floor was there and the teachers were trying to hold me back <coughs> and calm me down. <coughs> 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 Oh, such shit weed. As soon as I lit that. So. Burn that shit off, whatever that was. Ugh. <laughs> Tastes like fucking chemicals. <coughs> anyway. So. It was really, it was really funny for me looking back at how quiet I was before. And I remember <coughs> just exploding. I remember exploding um, and just calling everybody out in my class for bullying me, for doing this, for doing that, for pushing me, for calling me this. And I blamed them. I said, this is your fault. Why I want to fucking die. And I remember I had these joints with me. <laughs> and in the middle of my, all my screaming, I in the hospital, I'm oh, sorry, in the hotel room, <laughs> you know, after I've been pulled off the ledge and I'm screaming at everybody why I want to do this, I pulled out my little M&M case and I fucking lit a joint and I just kept screaming at everybody and I'm like, and I'm not gonna fucking stop. This is my fucking medicine. Da, 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 da. <coughs> and the teacher's like, oh my God, you know? And uh, yeah, I, I didn't even, like the police, I don't, I don't even remember if the police were involved. The school didn't want anybody to know what had happened. Um... I even blame the teachers. I'm like, this is all your fucking fault too. I've reported all of these abuses. You ignore them. You let everybody continue bullying me. And I'm like, this is all your fault. And I let everybody have it. Like I screamed it at the top of my lungs. And I just remember everybody looking at me like I was a totally different person. That, um, like, wow, this guy's pretty cool. 
And then after that, even though it was at the end of grade eight, um, everybody was like cheering me on. It was so weird. Like I became the most popular kid in St. Martin's <coughs> at the end. And I didn't know what to do with that. Um, and I wasn't able to go to the university. They were all going to CCH and I'm going out to RMC and um, and then, yeah, RMC was a mess. <sighs> Not to forget, as soon as right after I graduate, I get molested by somebody at the Boys and Girls Club trying to get my community service done early for high school. Because at the end of grade eight, we get told that you have to do like, you know, 40 hours of community service. So... Before I even get to grade nine, I'm like out all summer cutting grass for old people. And at the end of that, the person who <coughs> was managing that actually uh, took me back to his sketchy ass hotel and drugged me and did God knows what, probably on a recording too. And um, I felt very violated from that, but I didn't know what happened because I was too young. I didn't even know where I was. I, like, I didn't know how bad that hotel was that he took me to. And, um... And that was, um, really hard for me. Um, grade nine, I got involved with somebody who was all bad news. <laughs> um, I don't even know how he became my best friend, but uh, him and I were like total opposites. Um, you know, he was like a really, really popular guy, played volleyball, he knew all the girls, went to school with all of them. All the girls wanted him. And I was like his cute baby young brother that he, I, I don't know, maybe he just wanted to protect me. I don't know. Or like, I have no idea how we became friends, Richard and I, but it was Richard and Aaron <laughs> everywhere. And, um... And he got into some really bad shit, but I kind of fell in love with him because I was starting to feel like I've never had a friend like that before. And so I just said yes to everything he said, everything, you know, whatever Richard said, Aaron was like, okay, <laughs> I'm not going to lose this friend. So whatever you want, you know, and I became pretty well known at school as the guy that um, supplied all the weed. Um, I always had weed with me and um, maybe that's why I was kind of cool because like all the older kids hung out with me <coughs> because I had weed and, um, and I was really smart too. Like I never had to go to class and I was always skipping um, but I would get the work done, you know. I went to class after the class was over and I'd say, hi, <laughs> um, sorry, I missed your lesson. Can I get the homework for the, for the night or whatever? And I would do it and I was getting really high marks at first. Um, but it was because of Richard, you know, he told me to skip and um, I was already at school and he'd be like, you know, let's skip this lunch or whatever. And then it didn't look good that I was doing that because, um, you know, on top of that voluntarily skipping, I was also involuntarily skipping because I would miss the bus a lot. Still, as you know, I've been born late. Like, I was born late, so I've been missing the bus and shit my entire life. But the bus, the bus for RMC took me right out to the fucking country. And uh, I couldn't even walk there if I wanted to. And uh, it got into a situation where my mom was still, you know, I went back to my mom's after grade eight, after my uncle's for a bit. I stayed with my uncle for a bit, but <coughs> I was back with her, obviously. And my mom was still just as abusive 
and drunk and um, she got me up a lot. Um, she really fucked up my everything. Um, you know, she'd fight with her, with, with her ex, Darren, and they'd just scream all night. I couldn't sleep. Or um, she'd bring me involved and, you know, I would have to listen to her for hours, drunk. And, you know, if you say the wrong thing, then I would get the, oh, you're the worst son in the world, should have never had you. And then I become, you know, the, the reason that everything is going wrong in her life. So I had to say everything the way that she wanted. I had to be like this perfect little shoulder to cry on. And it was getting harder and harder to do that. So um, grade nine is when I, grade eight, grade nine is really when I started fighting back and being like, no, I don't have time for this. And then I would get the brute of her, you know, I would be blamed for everything. And um, I remember I started like, you know, actually pushing her off and, you know, getting her away from me. And uh, that's when, you know, she started coming for me again, like beating me really bad, like Darren. And she broke down my doors and uh, she'd throw me into toilets and th break shit at me. And I mean, the violence that my mother has done to me is out of this world, you know. And most of it is during a period that she was completely inebriated from these prescriptions that make her black out with the combination of alcohol. I really had no compassion for her until I took those two drugs by myself lunch later in my life. I was like, oh shit, you actually do black out. But besides the point, um, in grade nine, I, um, it's, it was a mess. I was kicked out a lot. Um, I had to sleep in the park or I went to my friend's place. Um, sometimes I snuck back in. She forgot to lock my basement window. It was constantly, um, it was constantly this, uh, fight mode at home in my life. Um, all the way until I moved out at 14, but 15 really, you know, I'm, it's really crazy. Um, but I had a lot of anger. Um, my mom ignored everything that she did to me the next day when she sobered up, no memory of it. And she'd deny it. And, uh, that just made me angrier and, um, my friend Richard, who just, who was like, he would take his mom's car for joy rides and I'd go with him. And, um, he wasn't restricted from doing that. Like his mom literally left him the keys, but I don't know what was true. I don't know if he was allowed to do that or not, but she just was never home. And, um, she would let him go to the store and get stuff at the car sometimes when she was home. And, uh, but like, I don't know if, if he was allowed to do it while she was away, but like we went for joy rides with her, with, with his mom's car in grade nine. And, um, he, Richard convinced me to take my mom's car. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And so we did. And my mom was completely inebriated. And so I was like, okay, let's, let's go. And, um, God, it was like four in the morning. We took the car to this parking lot and he let me drive it. It was really cute. He gave me like this little lesson in the parking lot. And, um, it was a little big parking, it was a big parking lot. No one was there and he was giving me driving lessons. And then we drove back home and parked the car and I went to bed and I woke up with the police there. And I got charged with Grand Theft Auto over $5,000 because my mom forgot to take the garbage out and notice that the car and me and the keys were gone. I was like, yeah, totally. That was me, I admitted everything, whatever. And um, I'm like, the car's back and I, I didn't drive it except for in a parking lot. 
and I'm really sorry, and stuff like that. And then um, my mom took Richard away, and Richard, um, Richard's mom uh, also um, was, you know, moving and moved Richard away as well to his father's or something. <coughs> and um, I swallowed a bottle of pills. Uh, on the roof of my house um, and some booze and then I got rushed to the hospital because they found the pills, empty pills, whatever, empty bottle and I got my stomach pumped and then, um, and then I went to therapy for a bit and I, you know, tried to explain all of the things that were going on and nobody cared, really. Um, Nothing got better. Um, and then I met Sarah, who was the first person I had met who had a life more difficult than mine. And I was like, whoa. In different ways, obviously, and I can't speak for her trauma, but um, I felt, I guess the word is now trauma bonded, and we backed up against each other, and um, we became very seriously in love because of all of our bonds and how much we've suffered, and how angry we were and how badly we wanted to get out of our abusive homes. And it's just like, it's so, it's so sad because no one talks about, um, like not enough people talk about and this was my book, was going to be a lot about this. I wanted to talk about how people are abused their entire life. And then when they, when they enter a relationship, they bring all of those coping mechanisms that you had or everything that you learned about conflict resolution uh, through you know, as, as, as that entire cycle and it continues and it continues into the next relationship and the next relationship, if you don't fucking make like a stop in it, like if you're not aware of it and if you don't listen and if we don't talk about it, um, you have no idea that you're doing it and you just, it's just like a vicious cycle of abuse. And I remember, <laughs> I remember Sarah and I, both of us, were just trying to save each other while killing each other at the same time. You know, we both had these insecurities, fears of abandonment, fears of abuse. Um, we were both so triggered by everything. And we were like, back to back and then sword to sword and it was the weirdest experience in our in my life because I loved her so much and I couldn't stop hurting her you know and I didn't know how to stop my anger I didn't know how to stop my uh, of what happened to me as a kid about what happened to her what continues to happen to her like what her mom is doing what my mom is doing you know, um, it really was a lot to handle for like a 15 year old, you know, and I remember both of us, we were going to do like this Romeo and Juliet suicide a few times, like both of us, you know, to, to save our lives, we were going to kill, e kill each other at the same time, like we we're going to kill ourselves at the same time, because we both knew that it was too much. And, um, 
it was too much for both of us. And I had been kicked out so many times and I was uh, sleeping in the park. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff that happened. And I, I, I do believe I, I tried to uh, kill myself multiple times um, between, uh, well, yeah, a lot. I tried to kill myself a lot without Sarah, with Sarah, her just as much involved and wanting to die as me. Um, and, um, gosh, we, we even, we, we were even going to use a knife, but that was her idea. And I, I stopped that one. We were sitting in the park at sunset. And she was a lot more serious about it. And I, I remember always being the one that stopped us. And um, it was because I didn't want her to die. And I didn't care about my own life at all. I just knew that she deserved more and I moved in with her mom and her mom tried to help me and um, I lived there for quite a while going to school and her family was different kind of abuse than mine but just as bad and you know the traumas that Sarah had carried were um, were big and uh, I had this mission to to protect her and heal her and make her a strong person. And um, I realized that the current person that I was wasn't wasn't able to do that. So it was really hard. Um, I remember we uh, I. <laughs> We actually got her, um, we were going to move out and we were looking at all these places and then, um, her mom wasn't able to take care of me anymore and then I ended up in the park and I'm sleeping in the park and, um, this whole thing in my head was to just get Sarah out of there and to, you know, I, I can't. There's nothing else that I can do other than um, maybe get an apartment and get her out of there. And um, I got a job at a pizza joint, this pizza shop, and I got paid five bucks an hour to the table. It's like 16 years old. And I got enough for my rent. And then it took a few months calling every single person in the world for a renter. Who will rent to us? Who will rent to us? I called everybody. And um, they all said that we were too young, obviously. No, we're not going to rent to you. And I would be so upset. I'd start screaming at them. Like, it says 16. I, you know, you're allowed to rent at 16. I had been waiting for this moment for so long to get an apartment after being homeless. And um, everybody was just like, no, you're too young. We're not gonna rent to some 16 year old. And I'm like, but it says that you're supposed to, right? And so everything started crashing down. I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna have to stay in the, in the street or whatever. And then along comes Dave Russell who probably only rented to me because he saw an opportunity to take advantage of me. You know, oh great, the 16 year old boy. Um, 
But we moved into this apartment and um, all we had was two patio chairs, a blanket, and it was so filthy, so filthy. And like, I walked to Tim Hortons and asked him if he could put some cleaner for free in a, in a cup for me because I just moved into my new apartment and it was filthy. And he gave me a whole bunch of different cleaners. This was like 3 a.m. to, you know, 16 year old me shows up at a Timmy's. Hey, do you have any cleaner? I don't even have money to buy a coffee, but. And it was like downhill from there, of course. Like how are two 16 year olds going to take care of themselves in an apartment? I think we just turned 17 because it took almost a year trying to find an apartment. And um, the, I had just turned 17. And then, yeah, Dave Russell happens. Um, we couldn't afford the apartment. We fell behind in rents. And the landlord uses my rears to force me into to sex. And um, my jaw is locking up. I can barely talk. The, um, the arrears on our rent, obviously, we're not doing very good. Um, Sarah and I were fighting a lot because I couldn't keep a job. <coughs> and um, she left. She went home. And I was about to lose the apartment. And I made that decision. And, uh, and then I got to keep the apartment. And then I went on welfare to try and make sure that he didn't do that again. Only to realize that welfare wasn't enough money either. But Sarah came back to live with me. And I started to get therapy. I realized like there's something wrong with me. My anger. I don't know how to fix problems. I don't know how to fix conflicts. I don't know how to communicate. I was like, what's wrong with me? And um, my grandmother had this family doctor who does like psychotherapy on the side. And she charged me for my family doctor visit instead, but did therapy with me and it was free. Um, and it was, a little, it was a lightsaber. <laughs> I don't know about that because lies. I mean, it got me this far. Um, but I finally realized, like, oh my god, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. What your mother did to you, or how you respond to it, don't do that. 
I know you're not a bad person for feeling that way. You know, it's normal. All of the therapy that I had dealing with my abuse um, was a miracle. And it's so interesting, too, because my mom and my grandmother both went to this doctor. And so this doctor had this perception of me of when everything went to shit. You know, my grandmother was seeing her um, when I was in Westmoreland and after her daughter died. And then my mom saw her after Natalie died. And so everybody knows, everybody kind of talked about me and like how I was being impacted as a child through all of these storms through my mom and my grandmother. And then this doctor meets me and was like, oh my God, this is the kid, you know? And um, it's been thrown around and she made it her number one mission to help me. Dr. McDowell, the angel. I'd spend like two hours there sometimes. She helped me with doctor's notes, with work, to get me to help them understand that I'm not, you know, I'm not the same as everybody else. She helped me with everything that I needed. It was the only doctor I've ever had um, that I can say really, really, really put my life, really put my life in her hands and protected it. And I felt safe with her and I learned a lot about what not to do and Um, it reflected, I think, but Sarah and I had been together for five years and, um, I was starting to feel that I wanted to explore another side of my sexuality and, uh, and we broke up most, mostly because of that and, And then we both got into to the gay scene. We were both partying, both doing after parties and meeting everybody. And she went her way and I went my way. We were friends, still friends. We've been distant a lot, but I love her to death. I always think of her. And, um... When she left, I couldn't really afford the place on my own anymore. I uh, started feeling suicidal again. Um, and then I got a really good job at this law firm. And things were actually really good. Really good. I was finally in the right place. I was collecting money and I'd been through so much therapy by that point that I had established a really good communication method and I was and I was really good uh, faking it. <coughs> I learned so much and um, Got everything paid off with my asshole landlord that took advantage of me to make make sure that I stayed in control of that and didn't end up homeless again. It was the most worst experience of my life. I mean, it's all been signed to the court, though. I don't want to relive that again. Um, but I got out of Dave Russell's place finally. I was making money. I met this guy. We had a kid. And I was like, oh, this is cool. And he turned out to be extremely abusive. <sighs> it 
tried to kill myself a lot with him. He almost killed me too. There's gonna have to be a part two, I need a nap. This is too much. Oh my gosh, so let's try this uh, again. It's the next day. I left off with my ex. I don't think I can really talk about that, but it was three years I was with him. And um, things were not really very abusive until I moved into his house. And then he became really territorial and <sighs> about his things and controlling and possessive. And I didn't respond very well to that and he beat me. And uh, he beat me so bad, I um, I ran to the front door to get out of the, his house. And uh, he grabbed me and threw me on the ground and started kicking me in my back. And it was like, this is like Christmas. And so I had just applied for school to go back to school. I left my job in London. I um, applied to go back to adult school. I was getting employment insurance. And all I could think of was, oh my God, I just did what my mom did. I went and got myself trapped in this situation with an abusive person who's willing to kick me while I'm down, begging for him to stop. That entire year was really abusive, um, even though I did everything that I thought I would never do you know, my, my first real boyfriend was just like almost the guy that my mom was with, except for uh, there was no rape, but there was a lot of substance abuse and there was a lot of just a lot of what my mom was like going through, you know? And um, I stayed and played the good little housewife. I acted like, you know, he was always right, you know, did whatever he said. And um, when I was about to graduate school, um, I bought these tickets to Madonna with my mom and um, he got jealous and my mom um, my mom decided to instead of making things worse to invite him and so we did and he punched me in the theater at the Madonna concert ruined the entire show for me because I had been waiting to see Madonna my whole life and and then after that I threatened to leave him and he threatened to burn all my stuff and so um I went back into playing the good little housewife and a friend of mine could see me deteriorating I was trying I was going to kill myself because I couldn't get out of the situation. And she offered her house and she got her friends to hire a moving truck for me. 
and I waited for him to go to work at, um, you know, 6 a.m. And before he got home that day, um, the four of us packed up my belongings, put it into a truck, put it into a storage container, and then I went to stay with her. And the abuse started immediately, like, threatening me to come find me, he said he had friends following me. And I was scared to leave the house, scared to go to school. Even like the night before my exam, he like called me, even though there was a cease and desist order. He's like, oh, I got gonorrhea and syphilis and I flipped out and could barely study for my exam. And I went down to the clinic and got tested and it was negative. He just did it to fuck with me. And he was harassing my mom and my grandma. And this went on for like six months. I ordered uh, like two cease and desists and he called me on my birthday, found out where I was working. I had already moved back to London by this point and he finds out where I'm working starts harassing my boss and like I called the police and he found out where I was staying I was staying like in this fucking spare bedroom of these people's house that like took me in I didn't even know who they were and I was sleeping on this blow-up mattress in their storage room and um he found out where I was and um I had been through, I had been to three places by this point. So when I was in Woodstock, he was harassing me. So I moved back to London to live with my mom. He was harassing me. And then I ended up homeless because my mom and I didn't last very long as expected because she's very volatile and abusive. And um, uh, she broke down another door actually at that point. And I left, my, um, I went to sleep in the park and then a friend helped me. And then I meant to move into the spare bedroom, the storage room of this friends, of their friends, sleeping on this blow up mattress. And then um, I got a job at a flower shop and that's when he found out where I was working and then where I was staying. And that's when I met Jane Crosby, who took my affidavit against Dwayne Dwayne Jeffrey and she arrested him and then everything was going to court and I had all the evidence um, and then my lawyer called in sick the crown attorney called in sick I got this guy that didn't even know my case my evidence wasn't submitted I was thrown around like some wet rag doll and uh, my ex was acquitted. And uh, three months later, I find this profile online on Manhunt with my name, Sun Junkie, my pictures saying I'm HIV positive, will take anything. And I, wa I wasn't, not that I have anything against it, but I was negative. And um, I, ca I called Manhunt and I was like, can you tell me where? this IP is coming from and he's like no I can't I'm like well this is my name I showed him my proof like my tags and all my websites with Sun Junkie and all this stuff and and I was like can you just tell me if it's like coming out of Woodstock or Brantford and he's like I can't tell you exactly because I'm not allowed but I can say that it's coming out of one of those places so I called um I called Jane Crosby back who this is now two years into trying to get away with get away from this asshole and I was like you know I reported this and you know we went to court and he got away and like he's out doing this shit again he's approached me in the bar multiple times since he got off and what is what kind of justice is this you know and she 
took it into her own hands and she couldn't believe that. She told me that she will take care of it herself. And she said, don't worry, Aaron. She's like, you're never gonna hear from this guy again. And I don't know what happened, um, but I think she went to his house and talked to him himself, talked to him herself. And she must have done something because uh, that was the last time I heard from Dwayne Jeffrey. I finally felt safe. Um, but I was so anti-love at this point. Um, but I was trying to get back on my feet. And I was doing really well. I was working at a flower shop in the bank. This is for Judy Holder. I was working for the mayor's wife of London, Judy Holder. And she was a really racist woman and she hired racist people. Um, and they didn't give a shit when I complained to her about the racism that was going on. Judith Holder herself called me a pavement special when she found out about my, my like ancestry. And I'm like, oh, what's that? And she's like, you know, like when the woman is in an alleyway and there's a bunch of men and it's like all falling out and they just like scoop it up and put it back in. And I'm like, that's a pavement special. I'm like, that's not how babies are created, woman. And I addressed that with her and her, her co her the people that she hired, there were two women that used to run the old Gamage flowers after they bought, after she bought it from her. And, um, you know, there, there was this East Middle Eastern family that came in um, and they did Native American tribal sounds when they left right in front of me and they know that I'm Native. And I'm like, that's not the right Indian sounds, but thank you so much for your racism. And they just looked at me like they didn't care and they talked to Judy about it. And she's like, oh, well. And so I quit because I couldn't handle the racism in that flower shop. Um, and I wrote a letter about it and I told her off and she didn't care. The, um, then I went to TD Bank and I worked my ass off to get full time there and I got it and I moved up. I got a new apartment, uh, Terry Trevithick, which was a nightmare of a landlord, absolute nightmare. And, um, you know, I had, I, you just have no idea what you're walking into. And now I know better, but like, there were so many red flags. Like he didn't ask for a lease. Everything was under construction. There was junk everywhere, broken glass everywhere. All of the fucking electrical panels were like open and there were like live wires sticking out of the wall in my apartment and it was constantly being renovated. And I, and he lived right below me and was a fucking troll of a, a troll under the bridge, like just constantly on me about things that like, hello, this is my living space. Like I'm gonna run the dishwasher at like 9 p.m. when I get home from work, whether you like it or not. Like I'm sorry, and he, I, you know, he made my life a living hell. And um, you know, I was afraid to walk around my apartment past 10 o'clock because he would scream through the fucking walls, telling me to stop walking around. And I'm like, okay, I I work until 10 p.m. I'm sorry, but like, I work two to 10 at, at TD. I don't get home till 11 p.m. And you're not gonna tell me I can't eat, right? And he tried to evict me multiple times for this, and um, I just stood my ground and. Um, uh, he came into my apartment multiple times. Like, there's a huge court order about all of that. You know, I don't, I can't really be bothered with going into that. It's all on, it's all on record what happened. But, um, I ended up doing something really reckless. Um, I was really depressed. I felt trapped in this house. I felt really unsure of what to do. Um, 
I wanted to go back to school and I didn't want to move to a new place and sign another lease, but I still had to finish my school. I had been working on my school. Oh, I forgot about this. When I graduated from school, I learned that all of the courses that I took weren't good enough to get into the University of Guelph, so I had to take more correspondence. So as soon as I graduated, I had to redo um, a course. And so I've been working on that this whole time, feeling like it was never gonna get done. Terry is, you know, being a, a thorn in my life. And um, I tried, I was trying to kill myself again. I was going down a really slippery slope. And, um, I was only thinking about it. I hadn't tried it. Uh, always, only thinking about it. And I was being reckless and I hooked up with this guy and, um, he was constantly trying to get in my pants. And I was like, no, I didn't, I just came here, you know, for oral or for play or to talk. Like I was never into anal. Still am not really. And, um, he was like, I want to fuck raw, I want to fuck raw, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, okay, the pressure, I'm, I'm done. Like, I can't, I can't deal with the pressure. Um, I go and I get up to leave. And I, my, my sock fell under his bed. And I go and look under his bed and it says, how to live with HIV. And I'm like, oh my God, you're trying to fuck me raw. Like, you didn't even tell me about your status and give me the opportunity to choose. So I felt really violated. Um, he had fucked my face for like quite a while and he didn't come, but I was really ignorant at the time and just felt exposed. Um, and I felt violated and, um, I got really upset and I, I, I was going to kill myself. I ended up, uh, on the train tracks, which was sort of really what um really was you know the early 20s like the train tracks were what i was trying to kill myself with um in that time frame you know it's you know i went from plastic bags to pills uh to train tracks oh i i'm sorry there was some knives that didn't that did, i couldn't i couldn't ah! Um, you know, that was Sarah's idea, sorry. I, I couldn't, oh my God. Um, but she actually was the one that introduced me to the train tracks because we had these train tracks behind us and I used to have to, um, we fought on those train tracks a lot. Um, fought the world together back to back. So I knew that if a train wanted to kill me, it would kill me and I, I wouldn't be able to stop it. And, um, the time I was, I thought I had HIV and I was like, oh my God, this is like something else I can't handle. You know, I've already got enough stigma for who I am and like my trauma. And, um, I already have a hard enough time with man now because of my ex, because of how abusive he was. So I was just like, this is not something that I can handle. So I just, I decided to kill myself. And, um, I was sitting on the train tracks and the train was coming and I had been waiting on the train for about an hour before the train started coming and I saw it and I'm like, oh my God, it's going too slow. <laughs> And I jumped out of the way in the, and I'm just like, I was maybe a couple feet from the train tracks as it like, and I watched it go by me, like right in front of me. And it was so fast. And I'm like, why did you look so slow? I was so mad. I was like, oh my God, you totally were going fast enough. But, you know, from where you're standing, like right on the tracks, it doesn't look like it's going fast at all. And that really scared the shit out of me. And um, I called the stranger, like this guy that I've been, been sleeping with. He was a dentist and um, he, uh, he was at work and I, I didn't know he was at work, but you know, he was in the ER and I, I told him about, um, 
what happened to me and um and and how i was feeling and he stopped work took a personal and literally came to my house like made me get off the train tracks and talked me out of it um and uh yeah it was really 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 weird um and that oh i forgot about this too the reason why i was so destructive oh my god i forgot about this I thought I was in love. So after after I left my ex, Dwayne, you know, I had a period of not wanting anything. And then I met this person online who ended up being a catfish who I completely fell in love with. Like, I'm so gullible, right? Uh, he sent me these pictures. And then like, he, he we never met for like eight months. And... Um, <clears throat> after eight months of like kind of being really infatuated with him and thinking, wow, this guy is perfect for me. He listens to everything I say. I was like, oh my God, this is so weird. And he was like, you know, he has a kid, he's a teacher and he didn't want to come out or whatever. So he doesn't want to like me, but like we always send pictures or whatever. And eight months down the road, I find out that he's, um, you know, 50 year old, overweight, totally nothing look guy that he sent pictures of and I felt really betrayed um and uh so that's when I got involved with that guy online I, I was just like you know um self-destructing and then that and then I found out I might have AIDS and then or HIV and then you know ended up in the fucking train tracks um and then that guy felt really bad um, about my, about lying to me about who he was for so long, um, that he is the one that actually bought me Romeo. He bought me Romeo. And, um, that was during that crisis. And, um, uh, yeah, he got me a golden retriever and paid for it. And, um, I took some time off work to raise him and, uh, get negative tests. And, um, in the time off, I finished my correspondence and I filled out my application for Guelph and they, they declined it again and said that I needed to go to Western to do like a general year first before applying to get experience at the university. So I applied to Western and um, so this was October that the HIV scare and then it was Halloween actually and then it was like six months when I went back to work and then I got my negative test and I got accepted to Western all at the same time. And I felt like a new person. I felt, I felt like I had a second chance at life. And it was like March, I decided to go on a trip I thought, oh, this is going to be the last time I have money for a little bit. I had no idea what kind of sacrifices were on the way. And, um, I went on a trip with the friends. And, um, I told my bank when I was going to go back to school and, um, it was really exciting. Um, I looked for a new apartment to move into September to get a roommate. I was going to take my car off the road and I was going to cut down all my finances. Like I was ready to commit to this and I was ready for the loss of money. I was ready for all of the expenses. I planned it so well. I signed my lease in April or May for September of that year. And then in July, on one of the hottest days of the year, um, there was an electrical fire in my apartment because my landlord 
had spliced knob and tube with updated wiring and it was just all fucking illegal wiring throughout the whole house and it blew and a room caught on fire within like 20 minutes and I was home and saw the whole thing <clears throat> and um yeah that just it destroyed everything I didn't have insurance um I ended up homeless. My landlord was a fucking psychopath and tried to blame me for it. Um, and I had to pack up my apartment. Pretty much I lost everything. I lost all the things that I got for school that I was saving up for. All the everything. And... Um, I had to put Romeo, my dog, in my mom's care. And I had to live out of my car for like two months because I had signed a lease for September. So July and August, I lived out of my car. And I'd go to, you know, sleep at men's places, but I'd have to sleep with them. I didn't really want to, but you just do what you got to do. And I begged the school for help. Here I am starting university and I spent the whole summer living under my car and that basically set the tone for uh, the next five years. Yeah. <laughs>